Hello friends, a very warm welcome to yet another edition of the Icons of Creativity. Today, I have the privilege and the honor of welcoming Mr. Rajiv Sethi. Mr. Rajiv Sethi is Asia's leading designer and is noted internationally for his innovative contribution to preserving and celebrating the subcontinent's rich cultural heritage. For more than 35 years, through his work in design and architecture, performances and festivals, exhibitions and publications, policy and program, he has identified ways to bring contemporary relevance to the traditional skills of vulnerable artisans' communities and creative professionals. Mr. Sethi has moved effortlessly from one discipline to another with his consistent vision for cross-cultural and scenographic practices, creating some of the most memorable artistic endeavours, setting world standards. His formative years were spent in Paris, working with Pierre Cardon and was mentored by designers like Ray and Charles Eames and eminent Gandhians like Mrs. Chattopadhyay and Pupul Jaikar, who encouraged him to direct his talents to India. He has curated award-winning exhibitions and events across the globe. His exhibitions for the Smithsonian's got him international acclaim. Aditi and the Mela and the Golden Eye at the Cooper Hewitt National Museum of Design, New York, brought leading Western architects together with traditional Indian craftsmen to create unique prototypes for a global marketplace. He returned to the Smithsonian in 2004 to scenograph the unprecedented Silk Road Festival involving artists in over 22 countries. Mr. Sethi has worked with environmentalists and craftspeople in 30 different countries to create the 70,000 square foot multicultural basic needs pavilion at Expo 2000 Hanover World Fair in Germany. He has been on the board of several advisory committees and is also a member of the Central Advisory Board on Culture Government of India. He has conceived and curated numerous installations and displays combining various medias as well as created and designed special artworks installations around the world. He is the first Asian artist chosen by Louis Vuitton to create special window installations across the globe as a part of an ongoing creative exchange, positioning traditional practices of skilled communities of India on an international platform. Among his other landmark projects is the art program for the new Terminal 2 at the Mumbai International Airport, the world's most art-filled and interesting airport. Art installations spread over thousands of square feet and, and is simply mind-blowing. Today, T2 is truly a new kind of public museum and art forum. I have the privilege of sitting with him at his Asian Heritage Foundation, which is a non-profit, non-governmental organization with concerns encompassing the cultures, traditions, public affairs, arts and sciences of all regions of Asia. It aims to support collaborative design-led initiatives and projects that reconcile the frictions between people, technology and nature, between the old and new, the east and west, and manifest in cultural products and services. Mr. Rajiv Sethi has got the third highest civilian honor, the Padma Bhushan. Let me ask him the first question. So when we talk about Indian design and Indian designers, your name appears in the forefront. You come from a very illustrious uh, family of freedom fighters. And you also have a beautiful background of creativity, which you have been practicing for several decades now. Uh, how has your background and your passion for creativity influenced your work, particularly in the changing Indian society? My father was a freedom fighter. My mother was a legislator for 15 years, from 50s onwards. She was the first female attorney from the Supreme Court, I think, in South Asia. But I think this... Uh, uh, coming from a family where giving was very natural. Everybody was, there was a load of people drumming, milling around the house and, uh, you know, sharing was nothing special. Our day began like that and our 
ended like that. And I think so the idea of uh, living and sharing and reaching out and finding one's own equation with society uh, wasn't sort of um, something that uh, I thought about consciously. It just came. Uh, where I think it turned into a creative impulse, I think it had a lot to do with uh, the kind of schools we had then. In my particular case, it was modern school, where we had a very transdisciplinary um, freedom to be able to express ourselves. So you could, what you used to call extracurricular, you could have many electives. I was a fine artist, so I was always painting. But I could do music, I could do drama, I could run a society for helping uh, children of the, uh, the domestic staff in, at the school. Um, so while we were learning, we had to reach out to share. Uh, that, I think, was part of the genetic code. Okay. So I don't think I, anybody taught me um, uh, these responsibilities. And I don't know how I fared, because it wasn't, one wasn't putting oneself up to be judged. I wanted to know anything else, so okay. we would do it. So you learned uh, while you were uh, doing things and in a, in a very collaborative manner. Uh, I don't know like else to do it. Okay. That was the way to do things. That, okay. That's the way to breathe. So everything connects, says Charles Eames. Interdependence is intrinsic in life. That's my the, yeah. That's what you have mentioned many times, and I've read it, I've heard you saying these. But you know, these are unprecedented times. And uh, you know, businesses are suffering, enterprises are suffering, we are all facing challenges, particularly in the creative industry. You know, uh, so is it true that uh, the only way forward now is collaboration? Uh, no, it's not the only way. All I know is that if you, you know, learned always to fall on your feet and not be swept away, then you'll find a way out of this incredible crisis that we're all facing. Uh, to turn it to a creative endeavor, uh, I think is survival. Okay. I couldn't do it any other way, as I explained. So, for instance, right now we are all planning uh, Ram Leela. I can't bear the idea that an important rite of renewal, like the Shara, like Durga Puja, suddenly for the first time, in our lives at least, that there is no sense of community. There's no sense of how to, to be able to come together. So I am quite determined that uh, I'm going to find a way, in spite of social distancing, I don't think it's social distancing, it's physical distancing. In fact, there should be no social distancing. So we really need to have a new Ram Leela. I'm calling it, I think, a COVID Ravan and a <laughs> Corona Ram uh, Lanka. Lanka. <laughs> and we're creating a Lanka and we're going to have a Ravan. We're not going to burn it because in a week's time, the air in Delhi will be, again, unbreathable. So it has to collapse. There has to be the drama of something happening where it comes to an end. <laughs> and so what comes to an end? Huh. Ravan has many things in all of us. There's greed, there's ego, there is um, um, ambition, there is um, a whole range of things that we have to put to end in ourselves. So each year we must end the Ravan in us. And Lanka likewise has much abuse. So we have to make this whole thing collapse. Okay. And side by side in the lawn that we have, we're going to have a, a Durga. But again, I'm most concerned that the potters are out of job. Likewise, mm -hmm. like in the Ram Leelas, 
the people who made Kapachi, who were really my first teachers. They used to make these wonderful effigies with bamboo, cut it in a way and put it together to create architecture. I mean, absolutely awe-inspiring and magic. So they are all out of work. Yes, so we went looking for them. Okay. We found them. Okay. And they're now going to work with us to create this collapsing uh, COVID Ravan and uh, Corona Lanka and uh, evergreen earth Durga, which is going to be, the dough is going to be made out of seeds. Okay. And we'll water it every day. So the Visarjan is, uh, happens, but it doesn't happen to pollute the Yamuna. It all sprouts. Okay. And then I think we'll all make some wheat grass and drink Wonderful. it. Wonderful. My God, what an amazing thought. So creativity My is the way out. This is the creativity at its highest. And oh. here we are all the time. Every day. Talking about artificial intelligence and we are talking about... Oh, you know everything virtual but here you are talking about something completely different something emotional you see artificial intelligence is still way behind us it doesn't have an emotional retina it doesn't move you it might soon get to emotional intelligence mm -hmm. but even so i think i'd like to believe that we'll always be a step ahead okay how beautifully put so you know when we are talking about technology now we are also talking about you know, the current COVID situation, definitely people are leaning much more on technology. However, a lot of young designers, I find, are forever constantly uh, using technology, even to do creative, uh, you know, uh, art or creating anything. Uh, what is this thing Nothing about people are forgetting to sketch, handwrite? No, no. Yeah, that is, what is that this? is, see, technology is a tool. In, in fact, exactly as a, a brush or a pen, mm -hmm. that's technology too. It's when you become, when it masters you and you're not able to master what to do with it, then it's debilitating. I think you need to be the one who decides what the technology you want, how it's going to express what's really inside. If it's, the medium becomes the message, then there's something wrong happening. And you have to stop, okay. and you have to say no, not mm. this, not this, not this. Mm. Neti, neti, neti. You've got to stop. You've got to rethink your strategy. You've got to see how do I find the tools which are going to make me say things in the way that they address my spirit, that they connect me with my hand and with my eye and my mind. So making, doing, being. The being part of it must result in everything that we do. Otherwise, it's just um, it's um, ornament. Yes. So, are you talking about that? Very often, you have said, "Feel the intangible, inherent in everything tangible." No, that is again a, a strategy. What if you tell, tell well, us more about it. Sukshma. Uh, you know your. I'm an architect, I design a veranda. Mm. It's a great place to be when it's raining. Um, it's neither inside or outside. It's in this liminal area. Mm -hmm. It creates a liminal area mm -hmm. where you're in constant touch with, but you have to be very careful about the proportions and design of a veranda. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's got to constantly be neither inside, neither outside. It's got to give you that liminality, that area of trance going from one to the other. But what if it's raining and I'm, I'm what, hearing the pitter-patter on the, its tin roof? Or what about the pakora that's going to come? Oh, wow, yes. Or that hot tea that never tasted so good. Now that's all intangible. As an architect, if I don't look at all these senses, I'm not able to create anything tangible. So with every tangible comes resonances that are completely intangible, that are there as part of your memory, as a part of your cultural upbringing. It's a part of your senses. 
it's the world of senses. If they, if you don't access them, uh, the tangible will dry up and shrivel and fall on the wayside. So you've got to be constantly relating these strong intangible resonances with what you are looking at and what you are creating physically. So they go side by side. There is the intangible of the tangible and the tangible of the intangible. And the moment we start going into these stupid things like courses of you know, plastic arts and we divide uh, arts into different silos, mm -hmm. we, we, are, we are preventing everything from connecting. You really cannot pluck a flower without altering a star. So how you do this is your equation. It's your way of finding these hidden connections. But everything connects. But how? How does the transformation happen? How does a young creative mind bring it into his DNA? The young can do it much better than we can. How? I'm too old to now keep washing that, that junk of education. <laughs> you know, a friend of mine called Ivan Ilyich huh? said, you're so lucky in India you don't have so many schools. Huh? So I said, what do you mean? I mean we're all hankering for <laughs> development. He said, well, what you need is a de-schooling. And he wrote a book on it, on de-schooling. Uh -huh. How do you uh, take away what a formal school gives us? Mm -hmm. The three R's are important. Retaining the world of science and the world of experience is important to know. But it means nothing unless you feel it. Mm -hmm. And not just vicariously, but with actually doing and making. That's when it becomes being. But when we talk about being... You, anyone can. Yes? Anyone can. What about the Children self doubts can. that keep coming in our heads if we are not sure? I mean... It's your it's head. <laughs> sure. Start yes. saying... Learn to say no. Okay. Quietly. Okay. Don't have to make it a huge no. Uh -huh. Just say no. Easy. Yeah? It's very easy. It works? You well, also mentioned sometimes, about, yes. not always. Okay. You have also mentioned very often that it's very important to be fearless. What I is think that? you hit the nail on the head. Yes. What is I think that? it is tell, about. Tell, tell, yes. It's the, it's the, the, the insecurity. Yes. What is of it? not knowing where we go. Now, can you remember when you first jumped into the pool, and your toes were no longer touching? in the deep end, what you only learn to swim then. Oh, it was a very overwhelming, over scary experience. Well, life is not always. So I think it's, you've got to convert that uncertainty from fear to adventure, to something that, of course you know the answer. Okay. Just as long as you say, I'm not going down. I'm going to fall on my feet. Okay. I'm not letting this get me down and out. Okay. I'm going to find a way which will, maybe my unique way or maybe something that I've learned and acquired or imitated, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I think fear is the most uh, dangerous, pernicious, horrific thing that has been implanted to in our in our in our memory mm -hmm. when a child comes out and you bring him out and you slap him to get his lungs to open or he comes in this operation theater look at all these lights they they they, they overpower you you're no longer uh, in the darkness of your mother's womb that you come out of that's what Le Boyer was teaching about when he talks about non-violent childbirth or what women in India naturally do. They go into the darkest corner of the house. That's always the one where jaccha bacha is. Yes. It's la no infection, nothing. It's the deepest, darkest corner. So the child coming out of the womb, which is dark and 
comfortable, comes out into darkness. They don't separate the umbilical cord till it stops beating. And then there are two beings and that's when they separate. And then again, they don't take the child and spank and all that and put him. They just bathe him in the warm water that it was floating in. And then they put it back on the mother. So the womb settles in. This, by the way, I'm talking about science. Mm -hmm. Children who were born with what they call the non-violent childbirth are born with less fear. Is it? Okay. I don't know how I was born. I didn't know about this when my mother was alive. I but I'm sure she would have used the same process. You are fearless. I mean, you not have... Not true, not true. Really? I'm, I'm not true. I'm, I I'm, have seen you doing so many unconventional things. Yes, you're always speaking up your mind. You're talking to, uh, you know, your heart out. You're supporting causes which uh, normally people in a comfort zone will not want to rock the boat. Yeah, most often it's foolish. <laughs> but okay. some part of it could be rubbed off as fearless. Really? Most, I don't take it as most of, completely. Uh, most often it's uh, foolish. Okay. Coming to another very interesting thing that you always talk about is a gifting process, which I think in particularly in today's time, we don't know, especially the young, uh, you know, minds. We, we say we have a huge demographic dividend. We've got a lot of young people in our communities. But what is this gifting process and how is it going to really help uh, come out, uh, you know, overcome this whole situation? I had a wonderful, uh, very close to, like a godfather and godmother, Mekhla Jha and LK Jha. Mm -hmm. The LK Jha, who is also the governor of the Reserve Bank, he once told me, and he did calculate, and he really went through it like a father would to a child. For the every one rupee that was spent on our education, mm -hmm. 25 naira pesa will come out of the pockets of a man whose child will never see the inside of a school. Okay. Indirect taxation mm -hmm. and all that. So, in fact, Everything that we do, you, me, everyone who's going to watch this, mm. is of the privileged. These are privileged people who've had an education. And we have subsidized by the poor. So there is a responsibility. I would say you have to give back. But I think I'm, going, I'm becoming selfish. I think giving is really getting. If you don't empty yourself as a creative person, you can, you can never get anything back. Mm -hmm. You must be empty. You keep giving and giving and giving, and things will start coming. If you try to uh, not do that, well, you're constipated. <laughs> but you're not, you're not an artist. How wonderful. So let us not be constipated as artists. And let us start understanding and... Sorry, our kala is in the street, I'm saying. In our country, in Ganga Nagar district, when we get a person, they say, how are you? Everyone says, it's good, you have to do it, you have to do it, you have to do it. They say, the street is clean. 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 But it's clean, the street is clean. I totally agree. At this age right now, I feel it's the most crucial. पेट तो साफ ठीक है, but आप ना ये कि फैमिलिन एनर्जी के बारे में भी बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग आपने कुछ बात कही थी कि हर इंसान को, whether he is a man or a woman, every human being should have feminine energy within. What exactly do you mean by that? Not should. Should is a very sad word invented in the English language. So we have. We can do nothing. There's a man and the woman and the woman and the man. Below this rock surface of gender stereotypes flows the hidden river. That hidden river is uh, really what we've already perceived in our mythologies and our ways of uh, constructing our, our uh, um, there is a, there, there is a, look at the Ardhanareshwar, hmm. divided in two, I create. What are these two energies and what is this I? So, uh, and of course, scientifically, you say left side and right side of the brain, and mm -hmm. you know you try to connect them. Mm -hmm. uh, I just believe in, in my case, the search was very defined to my the, the intuitive, the female side of me was very very um, evolved, mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, 
always wanted to, let me give you an instance. Again, brings me back to Mrs. Jha. I told you about LK Jha, yeah. but Mrs. Jha. Mm -hmm. uh, we, when we were little children, we used to go to Ramakrishna Mission. And at Ramakrishna Mission, we, uh, Mrs. Jha was our teacher. Uh, my, it was very close to my house. I used to live in Panchkoya Road, and it was in Pahar Ganj. So we'd walk every Sunday, we'd have our shops there, our, uh, our, our classes there. Mm -hmm. So she would then take us every Sunday to do some social work, some mm -hmm. art And we would go out to a leprosy colony, we would go to a slum, we'd work. That was our Sunday class. When we'd go to the leprosy colony, she would, uh, uh, would make us do things. And we did. We wrote letters, we cleaned up the house, we put it in order, we talked to them, etc. But she would go there and bathe them. They were really... She would bathe them, she would do everything, feed them, bathe them. And I'd look at her. I said, I can do everything. And I told her that. I said, I can, I can feed them, I can write letters for them, I can clean up the house. I, I can't bathe them. So she just looked at me. She said, yeah, that's OK. I'm, I can do that. I'm a mother. I, for me, that question was so uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. So since then I was seeking the mother in me. What is it that can, what is it so easy for a mother? Why can she bathe? So what is this mother in me? So that's the first uh, search for the feminine. And once I got into that, I think I could bathe them. Not too well, not as easily as her, you know, like literally all that, but I could do it. So it was putting yourself in that position and then addressing something else within, which if you had the courage, you would have found. I still have to go a long way. So you think evoking that feminine energy in everybody helps to uh, explore the creative as part of yourself? Without balance, we are not complete. We are not human beings. It's a wrong, wrong orientation, this macho-ness or this totally feminist approach. Mm. That's not it. It's too old. This is all now. It's contemporary uh, um, dilemmas. But it's we have to address the man and the woman and the woman and the man. It's not about just being feminist. I think it's very important for, uh, in fact, it's the men who need liberation. Absolutely. Because they've I gone mean, into, they not their fault. <laughs> they've so they've been got it, they've been like forced into a, yes. why me? There are hundreds of people who speak but like this. people talk, how many practice? How many people? I don't say I practice. No, 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 I, no, 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 it's not easy. I don't say that. That doesn't surface in me. Ego. But now that you have a touchstone, you do know where to stop. And that helps you evolve. One does not succeed. In fact, often there's failure. And I believe I've learned more from failures than I have from success. So do you think failures are important in life? To move forward and grow? I don't think there is any forward movement without it. How would you know uh, happiness, sadness, it's all flip of a coin, it's all the same. Have you ever failed and actually people say celebrate your failure? Yeah. The media or part that is known of work that I've done over the last five decades celebrates the success. I assure you that there are countless deeply entrenched efforts of mine that resulted in complete failure. I could do a much longer and much more meaningful discourse on failures than I can with success. Many. My goodness, you it's won't have unbelievable. The time. You won't have the time. All we see is the hugely successful, hugely creative, Rajiv Sethi, who has a fairy tale life and who travels around the globe and does beautiful things. 
and um, I'm so happy to know that you are also a normal person with normal <laughs> with failures. And I'm sure a large part of the audience who's listening to this will be, uh, you know, enthused that okay, if even if they fail, it's okay because people like you have failed too. The only thing is, I said to you is that we don't, you don't ever give up. Hmm. You fall on your feet, okay, not flat on the ground. Okay, so it is said that it's not about how many times you fall, it's about how many times you bounce back is what really determines who you are. Yeah, I think you need to, uh, is that, yeah, well, I've stopped counting. Okay. <laughs> oh, so you failed many, many times. Yeah. <laughs> Countless is the word, is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. How wonderful. So now let's talk about the craft that you are so, so close to. You know, so. You what know, do you mean by craft? craft, arts, all of this that you are deeply, 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 uh, you know. I've yet to find a word. Okay. Kala, Shilp. Okay. I don't know. It's all, again, if I'm searching for the transdisciplinary, mm -hmm. then it's not just uh, three-dimensional or tangible. It's performance. It's food. It's all what we now have started to call creative and cultural industries. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still haven't started calling that, but I sat in the planning commission, total fail of failure again, okay. one year mm -hmm. sitting in that Yojana Bhavan, yeah. trying to get the government to see synergy in getting all the ministries to think together, things that are related to culture and heritage, and that can be positioned as a livelihood imperative for the world that does not understand words like handicraft, handloom, cottage industries, khadi. They understand legacy enterprises. They understand creative and cultural industry. That's part of even the World Bank and the United Nations, UNESCO, all they brief are very, is very clear. But we need to address uh, this in a more holistic manner. So therefore, two plus two is never four. But in India, we, we have systematically, part of the colonial excess baggage, we've systematically bifurcated them and worked them separately. So one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. And we waste. So two plus two is not four, it's actually much less. Okay, what a pity, and especially now with the current COVID times, you know, there are artisans uh, mm -hmm. and everybody suffering. Uh, this this task, this clear entire clear. disorganized sector. It's an imperial system of governance that we inherited, top down. We don't see the base of the pyramid. That's just what has resulted to this mess right now, where millions come from villages. There's no reason to, because we never thought of republics. We never thought of village republics. Everything was centered around the city. Top down, imperial system. Governance was easier. You could control them better. They come here, they work in horrible conditions. And then when suddenly a pandemic hits you, you know how heartless it is. What and suggest? millions go away. Well, what it is what suggest? Gandhiji what had, what I suggest, what Gandhiji has been the torch bearer. He's, Bapu is the ultimate, he's, he is the future. He's already telling you about, as I said, village republics. Mm. He's telling you why you have to make the village more sustaining. Mm. The village can make things not just for themselves. They can make something for the whole world. They already understand the value of slow manufacture, of slow thinking, slow, slow travel, slow food. Everything doesn't have to be super fast. And not just for the present crisis. There will be many more pandemics. Mm -hmm. This earth cannot support greed. It can meet people's need, not me, Bapu. Mm -hmm. The need has to be understood. To live, what do I need? I did a big pavilion in Germany based on the basic needs. Uh, the German government asked for, there were six theme pavilions for the Expo 2000 in Germany. Mm -hmm. And I chose the theme basic needs. Again, it was an issue of the Maslow's pyramid, that you meet what is basic for survival and slowly, slowly you go to the more spiritual needs at the height of the pyramid. Rubbish! It's as if the poor don't have spiritual evo evolution or they can't think. Uh, you don't need an empty stomach for that alone. Of course you do. You do have to have health to think that way. But at every stage, what is basic for your survival has nothing to do with just food, clothing and shelter. There are many other issues that has given this country what it has. What is basic 
to my survival? To live, what do I need? That's the question we have always asked. In the humblest of homes, you, I've seen women who haven't been to school, have never touched a schoolhouse, sit in long, on the river bank in Pushkar or in the Kumbh Mela, go into Pravachal with people, you know, wise people who tell you what desire is, what need is. They're evolved people. We, this is part of our great culture. So we need but we have marginalized it or we've taken it for granted. And we have never really uh, quite uh, put our best foot forward for this very vulnerable sector who always have known what to do to support and sustain life. So it's absolutely important to continue keeping the need versus the greed factor in our head, absolutely. primary. To, to be able to distinguish what's greed and what is need. When need turns into greed, it's a very slippery path. At this point, let me take some audience questions. So we have uh, Veronica D'Souza who asks, as a scenographer, how do you envision the components of an, any scene and turn it into reality? Like, for example, the Mumbai Airport T2 terminal project. How did you envisage the whole thing and the way it is looking now? Well, uh, you know, uh, I would hate to say that I uh, became aware of these issues when I became a scenographer. That's much later. I didn't even know what scenography meant. In fact, the German government asked me to register my company with the term scenography. And uh, uh, we did. And the, I got a notice from the tax authorities about paying a large amount of taxes because I was, they thought I was dealing with stenography. <laughs> no, no, it was not funny. The matter had to go up to Supreme Court to explain that sonography is not stenography. So even I didn't know enough. So one thinks like a human being. Okay. And one started to say that, look, I'm traveling, and I'm tired. And I'm coming from one area into another area. There's this liminality that brings out a slight uh, alertness, that there's a slight moment where you transfer from your long voyage mm -hmm. back home or from your home to this long voyage. That liminality is something I had an idea about. Mm -hmm. And I said, how do we touch that moment, that chord, which can become a, a spectacular arrival or a meaningful farewell? So I thought of themes that could be best suited to people. And in this, of course, the patronage is very important. The patron's uh, commitment is what makes creative people think. Mm -hmm. If there's no patronage, creative would, creativity would be very difficult. I'll take the next question from Sunandan Ghosh who's asking you, is art patronage becoming a lost custom? How can we revive this? Art is becoming a lost custom. Mm -hmm. As we don't know what art is, then patronage won't know what to do. Yes, but apart from the, uh, though the pun was intended, I. I do believe that uh, 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 there is going to be a generation that's going to become more responsible mm -hmm. about the, the artists in, in our society. I think uh, museums and cultural spaces and the concept of the creative city, mm -hmm. that has never really been understood. It's all it has shrunk, like our senses. And I think it'll take a generation to understand that, no, there has to be a lot more. And a lot of good efforts are being done. I remember my friend who walked in there came to me from Spikmake. Now, there was a great brave effort of young people being introduced to something that we almost lost. That we thought, well, you know, a few people go see it in an air-conditioned hall. It's for the few, of the few, for the few. Because the pedagogy never allowed this. Yes, so, so patronage will begin with pedagogy. Okay. You start teaching the children what arts, crafts, what they do to you, to the soul, to the community, why they are especially pleasurable, why they are important for your growth and emotional growth, then they will start becoming the patrons of tomorrow mm -hmm. because they will understand why it's important for them and for 
all the community around them. So exposure is very important and that's what I meant. The art is now confined to the few of the few for the few. That's why Rajiv Gandhi's idea of the Apna Utsav was very important. It was too quick, too big, too soon. It was like most things in government. Sure. We just come and tamasha karke. So, you know, this is. Aha. But ye jo, uh, ha, Arvind Tambe ne yehi uh, question pucha apse. He's asked Museums and exhibitions of the arts have often associated with the elite. How can we make it more popular amongst the common man? Look, our country is a very strange place. Museum is Hindi. What is a strange place? So, we have to see that our aspas. सभी हुनरमंद लोग हैं हमारा देश गरीब देश है मगर बहुत हुनरमंद देश है इधर का दस्तकार ए दरिया काबिलों की उम्र बढ़ जाती है खुद कर लो हिसाब हुनरमंद का एक दिन बेहुनर का एक साल तो देखो आसपास देखो there's so many people with such great talent that we don't even recognize so let's find them museums will help to position it but still they are a, an alien construct. Okay. We have to, uh, it has to become uh, more every day. And they haven't grown enough to make it into a, an experience for uh, uh, people to walk off the street, to, to have a reflective moment, or to be able to look back or look ahead. So museums as ajayab ghars are treated as ajayab ghar, a little curiosity, a little, uh, entertainment but for them to become a center for reflection to be able to relate to our lives immediate lives and to be able to connect what's in the past with this to know what's happening in the future the future of our past all these issues require a very challenging uh, methodology scenography if you wish or even the uh, the the uh, accessioning or the uh, the uh, acquisitions it have to change. The museum's thought processes have to change for them to make, become more popular. They are needed as an institution, however colonial that giving is. But we need to revitalize them mm -hmm. to make it more relevant to a larger base of people. Wonderful. So I'll probably I'll show the museum of uh, 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 a short, uh, uh, you know, film on the museum uh, after this particular oh, conversation. Uh, yes. No, no, that's a sandar. That's not a museum. Museum. Okay. We call it sandar. It's a hands-on thing. Our okay. They don't have such facilities in the village. Okay. Me as a scholar, I'm in the embarrassing position of knowing more than the anonymous genius from whom I've learned. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have that access. I do. Okay. I can get into a museum, write a chitta to say, I need to study, go into the store and try and get people who need to see this. And all their references have gone, mm -hmm. have been picked away. They are relying on their oral need. So ours is, a, 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 it's called sandarb. Mm -hmm. So when craftsmen come, they can go, they can touch, they can feel, they can take away, they can study it carefully so they can replicate. It's hands-on reference. We need more hands-on references for those people who need it. Beautifully put. My goodness, I think this is the need of the hour. The last question Ritu Kaul has asked is, tribal art, our cultural pride is languishing. As designers and patrons of art, what do we need to do to preserve these at an individual level? I think from a, from a very practical point of view, uh, you know, everything is available at the, now on your internet, internet. Mm -hmm. but we've all learned by traveling. If you do not go and live in a tribal area, you can study all the very relevance of the world. You can study all the anthropologists that are extremely articulate you will not be able to understand it till you actually get out and see what this country has. There are hundreds, of, I've been to only about 450 districts, but there are 700. I don't have another life. I wish even I had nine lives, I would not be able to see what this country has to give you. But you know, we've had to travel on 
bullock carts, walking, bicycling, buses, planes came much later. Jeeps, jongas, yes. We have had to go through neck deep water to reach a place which I knew had um, a community that I needed to be with. So it's a journey that becomes the end also because it's so cathartic. It uh, teaches you so much more. So uh, enjoy, relish the easy access, but not at the cost of, don't become so vicarious, not at the cost of your, your, uh, your senses finding the open air. Wasn't that an amazing conversation with Rajiv Sethi, the man who has so much to share? I wish this conversation could have gone on. I, for one, was completely mesmerized. I'm sure all of you listening would have been feeling the same. A very big thank you to Mr. Rajiv Sethi, of course, to all of you wonderful audience, and the entire team of Mr. Rajiv Sethi and his office. This would not have been complete if I don't thank Orion Bell Tiles for creating this platform of icons of creativity. So, a big goodbye till we meet again for the next episode of the Icons of Creativity.